All righty. Well, I have three o'clock on the dot, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Now What? Tools to Use Moving from Workforce Assessment to Strategic Decision Making. Before we jump in, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Audio is available on your computer or by phone. We kindly ask that you please keep yourself on mute to avoid any background noise, but we do encourage you to keep your cameras on so we can see your faces throughout the session. Feel free to drop your questions into the chat box and we will do our best to respond as we go. There will be time for Q&A with the presenters following the presentation. If you have any technical questions, please send a message in the chat to Nolan Gill or Brittany Rector, who will be our tech support for this session. Thank you, Nolan and Brittany, for keeping us moving. All sessions are being recorded and will be available on the Train Learning Network in the coming weeks. Once the recordings are live, all registered participants will receive an email with the details. In the next hour, you will hear from three of our PHF performance improvement experts. Carol Morley is the Vice President of Programs at the Public Health Foundation with over 30 years of experience in public health leadership, including serving as President of NACHO and Chair of the Public Health Accreditation Board. Matt Stefanik brings more than 35 years of experience in public health management, performance improvement, and workforce development, currently serving as Public Health Ambassador at Kent State University. Lastly, Les Beitch, a retired public health practitioner and academic, has held leadership roles such as Commissioner of the Oklahoma State Department of Health and Deputy Secretary of the Florida Department of Health, and remains actively engaged in public health policy and education. Their full bios are available in the resource section of the conference page. By the end of the session, you should be able to describe new tools created by PHF that assess workforce expertise and capacity, discuss additional tools that have been developed by PHF to assist in prioritizing staffing needs, recognize additional methods developed by PHF to aid health departments in evaluating staffing needs for community-specific services, and describe how these new tools help assist in guiding future workforce investments. So as you listen to this presentation, we encourage you to consider how you can engage your staff in a meaningful discussion about the foundational public health services and make a plan to review and implement one of PHF's tools that can help facilitate strategic workforce decision-making. So now I will turn it over to our speakers to get started. Thank you, Mayala. So today we're going to share with you some tools that are developed by the Public Health Foundation to help you move from your workforce assessment to strategic decision makings. Decision making. You will um, learn the answers to some of the big questions like, now what? That's the whole point of moving us forward. But first, next slide. For those of you that attended yesterday's session, you will have heard Ron um, mention the PHF vision and mission. I just wanted to reiterate that PHF, our mission statement is to move from workforce assessment to strategic decision-making. It's to develop and help the, um, advance the workforce. We're all about that workforce in this whole conference. So the um, mission statement of PHF fits so, so perfectly with the conference and all of the discussions that we're having this week. So we will help you answer the big question of, now what? Here we go. Um, next slide, please. So Public Health Foundation, um, oops, sorry. We have many services available to the public, to you all in workforce, in all you all in what you're doing at your local and state levels. But some of the work that Public Health Foundation does around um, workforce capacity assessments, the prioritization of core competencies, workforce development and action planning, quality improvement and performance management, those are the top issues that people come to us with and ask for assistance. But we've been doing this for a lot of years. We have a lot of expertise in the, those are the, the main categories that we have focused on and that we'll focus on today as well. Next slide, please.
Sure. Well, I think I'm going to pick it up from here. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so this is uh, just to kind of get us going here a little bit and uh, get a sense of where we are as an audience. Uh, we want to get a, a little bit of a check in with you for a second. If you can try and answer this question, so many of you already are. Okay, so it looks like uh, about uh, a small percentage of you have uh, actually had an opportunity to complete uh, Foundational Public Health Services Workforce Capacity Assessment, about 16%. Let me just say kudos to those of you who've been able to do that. Uh, the question that we might be able to answer to, well, first, let me ask you all this. What did you do with the data that you generated from that? And if you're still trying to figure out what to do with that, pay special attention to some of the things that we're going to speak about today. For the, you know, a little bit more than a third or somewhat familiar, and you're considering going in this direction, utilizing the foundational public health services as a way to hopefully organize your infrastructure, you too may uh, may get some some useful information out of here because we're going to introduce a number of tools you may wish to use and you can think about before you start how you might deploy them. Uh, for those of you who are just beginning the foundational public health service journey, uh, this is not a requirement of the Public Health Accreditation Board FAB. However, it is very closely aligned with the FAB standards and measures. And if you use them, you will still have the opportunity to be in full uh, conformance with the work that FAB is doing. So if we can stop sharing that, uh, excuse me, I wanna close that if we could. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So I wanna take just a couple of moments to look at this image that comes from the Public Health Accreditation Board that arrays and lays out for you the foundational public health services. So let's just take a minute to do that. Uh, one of the questions that many people have uh, is how do we, where do these foundational public health services come from? And for those of you who are long of tooth and gray of beard, and I think that's me, uh, the, they actually had their origins in the beginning of the, the Affordable Care Act in the sense that just as they were trying to develop a package, a minimum package of health services, there was an attempt to develop a corresponding minimum package of public health services. And the idea was to develop a mechanism to define public health infrastructure necessary to be able to deliver or support public health services, activities, programs, and protections. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the model. And let me also take a second to acknowledge that uh, for some people, the word infrastructure, particularly when coupled with the term public health, public health infrastructure is a four-letter word, and you're beginning to already zone out. Please don't do that. Zone out a little bit later. The reason you don't want to zone out is we've got to have sufficient infrastructure in place to be able to support the delivery of community-based services. We've got to have that infrastructure if we're going to have public health practice that can do the things we claim we want to deliver. So describing the diagram now, foundational capabilities are at the base of the image. You see equity among those foundational capabilities, yet equity is suffused throughout the entire model. So that's kind of important. Let's not lose sight of that. Uh, the foundational capabilities are the skills, services, and capacities that are needed to support the public health programs, public health activities, and of course, health protections. So we've got to have those in place. 
above them, you see the foundational areas in, in larger circles. I think most of you are familiar with these, uh, you know, pretty common public health programmatic foci. And, and again, these are crucial for us to provide population-based services at the community level uh, in all the communities across our country. And finally, I wanna call your attention to two dots at the uppermost part of this diagram, one turquoise and one black. These small dots represent in very tiny font community specific services. And let me just say right off, community specific services are not foundational public health services. Uh, yet they're pretty crucial in the health department because they're generally speaking, the largest share of health department staffing. And see, uh, community specific services are pretty important because they represent the services that a health department provides that are unique to the community in which it serves. And those unique perspectives and services are, are drawn from things like the community health assessment, the community health improvement plan, uh, the health department strategic plan, if it has one, uh, directives of the Board of Health, perhaps uh, from other sources. So uh, may I have the next slide, please? So why do a foundational public health services uh, workforce capacity self-assessment? Let me just say there are many reasons to do one. Uh, and I'm going to touch on just a few salient ones here, but we could spend literally most of our time today just discussing the why of it. But first, it supports efforts for advocacy. You've got to have data if you're going to ask for additional funding in your local, state, tribal, or territorial health department. You've got to show what a gap might in fact be. And it is a source of data as well for internal use, organizational, strategic, and workforce development pl planning. So pretty key, pretty important. Some of the things we're gonna talk about today though was how do you take that data and make it into genuine information that you can use? It provides an opportunity to prioritize workforce investments as your resources come into play. So you may have larger gaps than you can fill at any one single time, and you've got to come up with a process for how you select which areas are most, again, crucial to fill now, as opposed to those that may be targeted later. And finally, uh, it's gonna also clarify areas of strength that you have within the workforce, as well as uh, indicate areas or identify those areas where you might have room for improvement. So pretty important. And if I had to just summarize those, I'd say, in short, you're going to provide data and information to strategically define your health department's trajectory with respect to workforce. May I have the next slide, please? So the Public Health Accreditation Board has, FAB, as you know, it has done a ton of work, and they have developed, uh, as well as several states, uh, capacity and cost assessment tools. So the, the tool that FAB has developed, because it's also our national accrediting body, it has become the gold standard for, uh, for this self-assessment uh, and capacity, to, uh, in the capa workforce capacity self-assessment. So it's an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, at the moment, it has 10, tabs in it. It's a, it's a, it's a hefty instrument. Uh, it ties to the public health workforce calculator. And if you're not familiar with that, let me describe it very quickly. It's a tool that was developed also by uh, FAB in conjunction with CDC De Beaumont Foundation and with staffing from the University of Minnesota and others uh, that will provide you an estimate that's population-based of what your uh, foundational public health services uh, infrastructure should look like within your health department. And if you answer a few basic questions around each of the foundational capabilities and foundational areas, 
it can tell you what a gap might look like, again, based on the population of your jurisdiction. So uh, the, the tool that FAB has developed uh, covers the foundational capabilities and foundational areas. However, uh, it does not include the community-specific services that I just mentioned a, a few moments ago. And it takes the, the, uh, the eight foundational capabilities, the five foundational areas, those 13 uh, categories, if you will, foundational public health services, and has operational definitions and headline responsibilities, breaking them down into 56 uh, smaller categories. Next slide, please. So part of, uh, we've had the pleasure of working with several local health departments, and we wanted to take uh, a little bit of time to put what we've learned into kind of an academic how-to that others might want to look at if they were going to pursue a foundational public health services workforce capacity self-assessment. And before we, uh, and that journal article is now out and I'll show that to you what it looks like here in just a moment. And we also did a blog posting uh, in the journal Public Health Management Direct, and I'll show you what that looks like. The article itself is open access on the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice uh, website. You can access it. I'm sure over time we'll have that as well on the, uh, uh, on the Public Health Foundation website which I know is under some construction right now. Um, but for those of you who want to dig a little bit deeper, it's a good place to go. Next slide, please. So this is, uh, again, just what the title page and, uh, and title of the article. It's, you know, one of those short titles, Northern Nevada Public Health Utilizing the Public Health Workforce Calculator, which I mentioned, and Workforce Capacity Self-Assessment Tools to do stuff. And that's what we did. And again, it's open access. And for any of you who want to dig a little deeper than what we discussed today, I urge you to download this article and see how some of these things might be relevant to your work. Next slide, please. And this is uh, what, the, what our blog posting looks like. It's not as in-depth as the article. Uh, but it, uh, it's a kind of a high-level summary, and so it may also be useful to those of you who are pursuing this work and has a few tips uh, there that you might uh, want to use. So I believe if I can have the next slide, we're going to transition to Matt. Yes. Thanks, Les. And I apologize. I can't turn my camera on. I need to save bandwidth, bandwidth on the device that I'm on. But uh, I think I'm bringing us to the point now where the title of our presentation, now what? So you've worked on a pretty extensive self-assessment using the Foundation of Public Health Services spreadsheet tool. Congratulations, that, uh, that was a heavy lift. Uh, for those of us who've done all our part of it realize that. So uh, as a consequence though, uh, what you've yielded is a, uh, an estimate of the cost of uh, or your current rep, or, uh, resources committed to kind of foundational public health services in terms of uh, staffing, full-time equivalents, and also a gap analysis, an estimate of what full staffing would be and what that additional cost might be. So what? How do you turn that data into something actionable as you begin prioritizing how you may uh, invest new resources for workforce recruitment and retention and de development. Well, we're gonna share with you uh, in the next few minutes, some tools that we've recently developed at the Public Health Foundation that can, can help you with those next steps. Next slide, please. So the first tool is, um, it's a spreadsheet that is uh, intended to help you uh, assess your expertise and capacity in each of the uh, 13 foundational public health uh, service services areas and capabilities. And 
A second, and we'll go through that in a little detail here momentarily. Second is to uh, give you a sense of, or give you a code book essentially of what some of the community specific services that most or many health departments use that uh, you will need to figure into your overall staffing and resource needs in addition to the foundational public health services. The third is a prioritization matrix that will help you once you've made a decision uh, uh, or have a menu of choices for staffing up to meet FPHS, how you might prioritize those, those new hires and, and what positions and what places in your health department they might <laughs> they may be placed. And finally, our hiring flowchart will also enable that, that process of bringing on board the new staffing uh, to help you meet foundational public health services. So let's turn to the expertise and capacity uh, assessment tool first. Next slide. So uh, I had hoped to show you a live demonstration of the spreadsheet. That wasn't possible, but um, I will take you through the key elements of it with the next slide. Thank you. So this expertise and capacity self-assessment tool is it's intended to help you decide where to begin making investments in staffing, staffing up for foundational public health services based on your own assessment of your health department's existing capacity and expertise. This self-assessment, we believe, should be undertaken as a group exercise with, with uh, relevant leadership and staff in your health department. This tool contains sample data and outputs to illustrate how the tool works and blank data entry and automated output tabs for your own data entry and reporting out. Next slide. So this is a sample data entry tab. It shows how a health department would assign scores uh, a categorical scores, categorical variables to each of the 56 of uh, what FAB calls headline responsibilities in the 13 foundational areas and services in the in the in the uh, in the FAB capacity and cost assessment tool. So these values we assign for each of the headline responsibilities as being either absent or not applicable, all the way to expert, in other words, you have expert capacity. In, in expertise um, as the area that, uh, that I've highlighted in, in, in yellow on the right side of the screen shows the drop down menu has you assign a value to each one of those headline responsibilities. To the right of that, um, you would also assign a value of, uh, of absent to full in capacity using a drop down menu provided in the tool for for your own assessment of your health department's capacity in each of those areas. Next slide. So once you've done that uh, line listing of those 56 headline responsibilities and uh, entered your assessment, uh, the tool will, uh, in the output tab, will summarize the scores you've assigned to each of those 56 head on responsibilities by foundational area and service. And it will assign a weighted value of zero to three for expertise and capacity to each of the 13 foundational public health services in, in the way that this, this sample summary tab has done for you. Next slide. So it's very useful to depict data output from self-assessment tools like that. And that's what we've done here, uh, showing you uh, the, uh, the relative uh, ranking of uh, each of the FPHS by capacity expertise in the tool, uh, you know, along with the code book uh, next to it for reference. Uh, so the sample output clearly shows some things that may not be surprising to you uh, in, in your health department. Um, uh, 
many health departments as they undergo a self-assessment, either for preparation for accreditation or doing a FPHS self-assessment, find themselves to be under-resourced in chronic disease and injury prevention in both capacity and expertise. Uh, likewise, um, access and linkage to care is another often uh, under-resourced area, as is uh, uh, equity. And uh, not surprising given the investments that we've made in, uh, in uh, assessment and surveillance uh, and developing epic capacity over, over the years through uh, public health infrastructure, I'm sorry, public health uh, emergency preparedness funding, we often see a fairly well-developed uh, capacity and expertise in those areas of assessment, surveillance, and community partnership development as well. So this is a sample output from a uh, self-assessment. Uh, another way to uh, look at this is to look more closely at each of the foundational public health services. And uh, in the next slide, we, we do that. Suppose you wanna look at uh, the, um, your, your, your self-assessment in strictly in the, in the, in the uh, FPHS so assessment and surveillance. Well, you can do that here. See how uh, how, how how you've rated yourself in capacity and and and, and um, expertise in the uh, in the five headline responsibilities under assessment and surveillance. Now, some of these responsibilities are not relevant for every health department. For example, your health department may may not. Uh, maintain a vital records infrastructure that's done by another health department or, or by the state. Uh, likewise, uh, your health department may depend on the state public health laboratory or another public health laboratory. In those cases, um, there would not be a, a, an assessment value assigned. But um, using uh, the tool output, you can drill down into each of those foundational public health services to see, uh, to see what uh, to see what your self-assessment yields. And with that, I believe uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Les to talk about our next tool, which would be um, uh, identifying community-specific services. Thanks, Matt. And, you know, I just wanna take a second and I, I realize you know, Carol, Matt, and I have worked together for quite a while, and I want to thank my colleagues, but it's really been uh, so such a rich, complementary group to work with. And uh, and again, our skill sets actually and our and our glaring weaknesses complement one another extremely well. And you know, it's the the tools that Matt just described to you. I, I think some of us do better thinking through words and images, uh, those graphics, you know, really help you hone in on where capacity or expertise may really be at different places uh, in your health department. And again, just one other thing to think about when you're trying uh, to prioritize what you do with all that rich data you have and trying to translate it into information. So moving, uh, from foundational public health services to community specific services, want to take just a quick second and remind us again that foundational public health services are the most basic public health infrastructure necessary to support the public health enterprise, essentially. Some commonalities among them, they are population-based services. That is the key. That's what differentiates public health from uh, clinical medicine and other health services out there. It's population focused. Some of the services may be mandated in law and but on that basis may not be just population based. And finally, services, there are a whole slew of services that public health is the main or primary provider for uh, when others in the community can't, can't pick up that role or responsibility or public health is particularly capable in that arena. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So there are some differences. Community-specific services may differ widely from 
one community to another. In fact, they can differ uh, from one health department to another, even within us in that in the same state. Uh, they are typically that area of the health department that has the most staffing. And again, why is that? Uh, because they're the programs and the programs are often what funders and boards have the most interest in. But as noted before, they're not foundational public health services, and yet they're still vital in the health department uh, enterprise. So, as I mentioned, they're consistent with your community health assessment or the work that you've done with your community health improvement project. In contrast to the, uh, the community-based foundational areas, they may be individual or non-population-based services. They may be clinical services. They also may be an array of environmental services uh, done in your community that aren't required by statute within a given state or jurisdiction. And additionally, they may be wraparound services that are not provided elsewhere, case management, care coordination. So uh, if I can have the next slide, please. Okay, so this is where we ask you to weigh in again for just a moment. Are you including community-specific services in your foundational public health assessment or planning to? So let's just give that a, a moment to load. Yeah, I think that gives us a pretty good snapshot. So we're going to share those results. As you can see, about a quarter of you either have or are considering it. Uh, about a somewhat smaller number, but about a fifth of you are not. And then we have that great uncertain area. And then we have 1% of you who are going to catch up on your rest. So mm -hmm. let me stop sharing that for a moment. And if we can, can we turn to the next slide? So there are, in my view anyway, a number of compelling reasons why you might want to include uh, community-specific services if you are doing a foundational public health uh, workforce capacity self-assessment. So let me highlight a couple of that are actually on the screen and, and give you just a few more. So including an analysis of CSS staffing provides a comprehensive inventory of public health capacity. So by that, I mean, you now have the entire health department workforce included in your analysis rather than a smaller, lesser share that's focused on infrastructure alone. CSS meets the needs of every unique community with a mix of services. And so you're seeing those things that you're staffing that are based on your CHOG, your CHIP, and your strategic plan. The anticipated distribution of the workforce, as I mentioned, the largest number is within, typically within CSS. And so there has to be a strong foundational set of services that have to support the health department, but we need to see what it is they're supporting. Uh, CSF staffing analysis is critical to give you the entire picture of what's going on in your health department. And as I sort of alluded to earlier, the community-specific services are often the darling uh, of your governing board or of funders. They want to know about programs, and for them, the word public, the words public health infrastructure are more like those four letter words I described before. So if you include CSS, you are defining and articulating the full scope of work for each employee. Why am I saying that? Because in many health departments, depending on size largely, staffing staff members work within foundational public health services 
and also work in terms of community specific services. So their entire FTE is going to be examined through your analytic framework if you include them. So, and you're basically have an opportunity to look at each uh, FTE and role. So you're ensuring that both infrastructure and programs are included in your workforce capacities assessment. And finally, you get that comprehensive, uh, you know, kind of look that I mentioned earlier, but in terms of planning and to facilitate your advocacy. May I have the next slide, please? So if you were just looking at what's an inventory of community-specific services, the good news is that they're arrayed using the same framework as the foundational areas of the foundational public health services. So these should look familiar and be well known to you. May I have the next slide, please? I'm going to give you a couple of examples, not all five uh, areas, but let me just take a second and talk about two of them. And I'm going to begin with the commu communicable disease arena. So let me uh, just make a couple of observations and we'll We'll dig just a little bit deeper for in a moment. All of the things that I've listed here, immunizations, STI, TB, HIV, they're all individual and for the most part, clinical services. Uh, the foundational area of the, of the, uh, the corresponding foundational area, again, is that population focused area where it's about planning or screening or prevention or data, for example. So providing immunizations, including international travel, could be juxtaposed with an immunization campaign or promotion or the work required to have an immunization registry. All of those are population focused. STI clinical service could be in comparison with sexually transmitted infection, screening, prevention, disease reporting, analysis of your data, TB treatment, similarly, screening and prevention, and so on. So that's in the communicable disease arena. May I have the next slide, please? So uh, this is chronic disease and injury, uh, where again, if you just look at diabetes and child safety seats, you know, those are specific programs that are individual and or clinical. Child safety seats, again, you could have a promotional campaign that would certainly look like it's more of, of a uh, foundational area program in, you know, traditional injury. But look at uh, adult falls prevention or workplace wellness, suicide prevention. Those are, in fact, potentially population-based programs, depending on how you do them but they exceed the scope of most existing public health infrastructure. And so they are categorized then uh, within that larger group of CSS services. So if I can have the next slide, please, I'd like to call on you to, to tell us what are the major community specific services mandated, or I should say mandated or offered in your jurisdiction. Can you uh, list a few in your, in your neighborhood? your neck of the woods. Less that poll may be less um, of an enticement. And so maybe we could have people just list them in the chat as well. Oh, sure. What a great idea. We're all about enticement here. Well, Sometimes. You, you did mention the discount on uh, PHF printed materials that they could receive based on, oh, those materials are already free. Um, well, I'm still looking for that enticement then. What do we have here? Are you able to show those somehow Mayela, uh, I'm not seeing them or where, I don't know where to look for those that were shared. Yeah, I so, think this is maybe the first time we've done an open-ended. Uh -huh. I need to share another screen. If you would give me one second. 
I'm going to stop sharing and reshare the responses that people sent in. And like I said, while Mayel is doing that, please feel free to share those in the chat as well. Okay. All right, nurse home visiting, opioid treatment, and HIV treatment. Okay. Yeah, opioid, yeah, a loser, suicide prevention. CIS prevention are, again, somewhat more population-based, but may be beyond your normal uh, scope. Uh, home medical waste protection, certainly, and probably non-statutory, right? Vital records, environmental health, okay, communicable disease, ambulance slicing, nutrition. And one of the stunning things is WIC is considered a community-specific service. Um, yeah. And so that would probably be the most common community-specific service that's in many, if not most, health departments. So CHAS and CHIPS. Um, mm -hmm. HANDS is a program that's a state-specific program. I'm forgetting what state now. Is that Ohio or Kentucky? Uh, immunization for children, so actually applying immunization. So thank you. Those are all, you know, very good examples um, that, that we wanted to see what you, you know, we wanted to make sure that you guys could think about that and give us a sense. So thank you for testing our, our, uh, that polling. And if I may, can I turn things over to Carol? Oh, thank you, Les. So keep posting those community specific services in the chat that will help us all decide and hear what you're all doing at the local level or the state or territorial or tribal level. Um, we've discussed several new tools. Um, and also in the chat, if you have other tools that you are using at the health department that you think are effective and are helping you work through some of your workforce assessment issues, post those as well. We'd love to hear from you in the chat how um, you're using different tools out there as well. So with large amounts of assessment data that often are identified um, using several of the infrastructure, you know, the infrastructure brings up gaps, we have limitations on our resources, both health departments need to prioritize what they're doing in order to figure out what you do first or you do last. So we prioritize so that we can determine what's next. When faced with these large foundational public health service assessment gaps, which all health departments have, some big, some small, the health departments can strategize their next steps to increase the capacity by prioritizing what needs public health foundation prioritization matrix can help you with. We can translate those priorities into actual positions also by combining the results into a hiring flowchart. So Mayela, could I have the next slide, please? We're gonna talk just a bit about this matrix. So Public Health Foundation created this seven criteria matrix with the definitions, with the help of the staff at the Northern Nevada Public Health. So if any of you from Northern Nevada are on this call today, thank you. You know how important it was, the work that you did to help us with this. But by writing out the definitions for the criteria that you're using, it, it made it so there was a consistency of a, the understanding by the staff of using the tool. So this prioritization matrix, matrix is designed to assist the staff who are engaged with the Foundational Public Health Service assessment in setting priorities for what they would focus on next. So how does this matrix work? Um, you fill in the cells above the black lines that you see, and you also rate. So I, I could share my screen if I think that's going to work, Mayela. Um, and all right, we're going live. <laughs> Are you seeing a matrix? Yes. Yay! 
So this will just help you in a little bit bigger view. I know some of our um, slides today were very small because Matt was not able to go live. But you can see from this matrix, these seven categories or criteria that were chosen by the health department. And the rating tool that you'll see, definitions are cut off over on this side. But as you manipulate or have the discussion in your health department. So for this health department, maintaining their current staff was more important than the need for growth and expansion. So they gave it a five on a scale of 0.1 to 10. If they would have said that maintaining was equal to the need for expansion, I'm gonna change that category to one and we're gonna push enter and watch what happens over here. Did you notice how those rankings changed and how the row totals changed? I'm gonna change it back so you can also see how that works. I'm changing it back to a five. It's five times more important than the need. We're gonna enter it and there you've got a ranking change. So just to show you, you would do that with each of the categories, the capacities that you have identified, you rank them across the top as well. You put in your rank of 0.1 to 10 and the tool calculates for you the total ranking and then it ranks them in priority order. One being the most important priority, seven or eight being the least. So you can see in this health department, span of control and workload, they were not foundational issues at all. But for this health department, these were critical capacities that they needed to work on. Their span of control was too much. Their workload was too heavy based upon the number of FTE they had. So those two criteria and capacities rated number one in their ranking tool. So I'm not going to belabor that, but I just wanted to give you all an example, real life example of how to use that tool and to show you that it does rotate and flex on its own. It's all programmed to do that. Next slide, please, Maella. And I want to show you just briefly that that, that matrix tool that we've designed and developed expands. This is a 21 category matrix. Again, you can't see it well on the slide. I'm, I apologize for that. But just to know that as you may have a lot of, of capacities and criteria that you need to feel like you need to prioritize. When you do the expertise and capacity assessment that Matt walked through, you might identify up to maybe five or six of those alone that you need to work on along with your competencies um, from the, the core competencies um, and from the foundational public health service work. So this is just an example how it can ebb and flow with you as you find those different um, areas that need to be focused on. Next slide, please, Mayela. So once your team has prioritized those gaps and needs and you've come up with your number one to number 10 in where you think the priority focus should be on, using another public health foundation tool along with the um, prioritiz prioritization tool, um, helps you and your staff position to be positioned for recruiting and hiring new staff. So to make sure that you take into consideration the priorities that you have on the hiring matrix and can load them into a flow chart or a decision-making tool so that everyone is using the same, you're all grounded on the same way as you're looking at hiring into new positions that might be needed. Next slide, please. This is just an excerpt out of that last slide, but it shows you that this new hiring flowchart flow tool translates the priorities from the actual hiring decisions by giving point factors to the prioritization criteria that you've identified and by staff and helping the staff to walk through a flow chart to determine which candidates that might meet the identified gaps that you've already identified. So by combining the results of the prioritization matrix with a hiring flow chart, you can easily demonstrate that you are addressing your workforce gaps and needs. We have found that presenting this sort of information to your board of health, to your elected officials, especially, they like to see that you have thought through what's next following that initial assessment. 
Next slide, please, Mayela. So by utilizing the, the, the Public Health Foundation tools and approaches, health departments can more effectively move from workforce capacity self-assessment, the data that was collected, to concrete actions that strengthen your ability to deliver essential public health services to your communities. By utilizing these new tools, it takes you from, great, now that we know the cost of how much it's going to be based upon the, assess the foundational public health assessment, now what do we do with the information? What we do with the information is so critically important, not just to leave it at, oh yeah, we now know the cost. How do we communicate and show the total outcome to our boards of health and elected officials and to the rest of our staff that have inv been involved in this quite labor intensive process to show them how we've wrapped it up in a package that we can communicate now the next steps. So these tools help you move beyond just determining how much the Foundation of Public Health Services costs to making strategic decisions. These new Public Health Foundation tools seem to be the missing pieces in making sound strategic decisions and presenting a robust plan for convincing elected officials for increasing our funding and to, for the support of our public health workforce. So we are so happy to have been able to share some of those tools with you today. And we are looking for questions, um, comments. We have just a few minutes left in our session today. But if you have questions, please add those to the chat. Um, if you have other tools that you're using from your health departments that would be helpful or ideas on the tools we've shared today, please also include those in the chat. And we'll see if we have just a couple um, questions out there. Ron, if you were monitoring questions, um, did yeah. anything pop forward? So I tried to answer a few. There's there's one that I think is really worthy of discussion that I think a number of people will be interested in. It's it's how do you prioritize different strategies based on expertise versus capacity? So for instance, capacity building initiatives might take precedence in some areas where skills exist and skill building might take priority in areas where there's capacity but less skill. So does the calculator or any of the tools that have been that we've developed help with that? Mm -hmm. So the, the first thing, if I can just, the, the public health calculator doesn't make that distinction. Uh, so that's, that's strictly uh, based on the number of FTEs that are calculated on a population basis for the jurisdiction. So then the question becomes, uh, you know, what do you do with the information that, that you have? And uh, so there are a few things in the chat about evidence-based approaches, but, you know, it's really up to senior leadership to kind of, you know, to look at those tools that, that Matt offered up and decide which of those things may may offer an opportunity to have a criteria that you may want to place within your prioritization matrix. Uh, you know, it may also be part of something that, you know, your workforce development folks really try to hone in on, you know, you may have adequate capacity, but again, not, uh, not all the expertise that you need to have, the skills, skill levels may not be there. And I think we saw a few in Matt's sort of dummy data that he had in there. I know we're not going to go back to that. Carol, other I think thought? the other beauty of the tool is the enticement for the discussion that happens at the staff level. So when you're looking at the expertise versus capacity and sitting around a table with leadership and your, your leadership staff or whoever you're choosing to work on this project together, the robust discussions that come out, the sharing between your environmental staff versus your clinical staff versus your community promotion staff, um, and all of them explaining the different levels of expertise they might have, but no capacity, or explaining they have a capacity, but no expertise, and how the training can come into play with that, workforce development training to get skills and expertise skills developed in the capacity that you have. I think sometimes we forget that that's some of the most robust outcome of the tools is the discussion that's had. Great point. 
there was a follow up uh, that seems that efficiency should be the criteria in the prioritization matrix as well. Um, but how do we calculate what will be more efficient hiring people or developing the current people? You know, a great question. And I think um, that has to do with the expertise and capacity discussion as well. I think many um, health departments these days are, are recreating their workforce. They have great staff, well committed, and they're just helping them re, uh, recreate and re-educate into um, some more of the expertise areas. I see Matt jumped on. Matt, have you got some words of wisdom for us? Both you and Les have spoken well about you know the lim limits of using uh, tools like this to try to quantify concepts like expertise and capacity. Uh, the truth is not in the numeric derivative of each of these self-assessments. It's in the in the outcome of the of the the informed the consensus of an informed opinion that comes out of the uh, discussion among leadership uh, across the breadth of the the health department. We three of us have seen that happen in several health departments. Uh, just one other point. Thanks, Matt and Carol, too. You know, efficiency in the example that Carol showed you from Northern Nevada Public Health, efficiency was not one of the criteria uh, that arose to the top. And so that's likewise, you know, Carol mentioned the importance of discussion. The, the criteria that you select to use in the matrix, and you can select up to 21 of them with the example matrix uh, template that's now available you can make those choices but that's a, a you know that's something for the assessment team in leadership to 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 converse about and try and decide whether that's worthy of consideration there is a question that i'm not exactly sure maybe um case smith is there a strategy to incorporate this with competencies and sub competencies or a tool for training uh Workshop. So maybe, Kate Smith, you can um, add to that a little bit more. Regarding foundational public health services and competencies, uh, when I get to that link, there, there is a link to a tool where we talk about the relationship between the essential public health services, foundational public health services, and core competencies for public health professionals. Um, and we will drop that in the chat in a moment. Should also mention that the tools, they're probably a little abstract to everybody at this point. You've seen them on the screen, but you haven't had an opportunity to play with them. We are constructing a, a toolkit, but we're gonna look for a way that we, we can send some of these out to participants of the session so that you can begin playing with them, looking at them. And as our three speakers pointed out, the process, the discussion is what is really key, just like accreditation, going through the process with staff is so, so important. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have a couple of slides to wrap up, but I don't know, um, Carol, Les, and Matt, if you have any last words of wisdom or uh, closing remarks, now is a great time for that. Well, I get the slides back up. Thank you for that last slide. Um, more information, again, contact information for Ron and myself at Public Health Foundation. And um, we will, like Ron said, be sharing slides and tools in the short upcoming couple of weeks. And if I was going to throw something else out there, it would be that foundational public health services and the workforce capacity assessment provides a ton of data. Mm -hmm. So then you have to harvest that data and channel it into information. And that's what the tools that we've been talking about can facilitate. So that's, you want to end up with something that can actually transform your health department after doing all the work that Carol, Matt, and I have described. So in doing the assessment is necessary, but insufficient to transform your health department. You've got to prioritize and get into actionable steps.
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Matt, Carol, and Les for your time and for this amazing presentation. And thank you to all the participants for your engagement in the polls and in the chat box. Uh, we love hearing from you during these sessions as well. Um, please join us again tomorrow. Our first session tomorrow will be at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and it will be Maximizing Workforce Excellence, Leveraging the Core Competencies for Public Health Professionals and the Train Learning Network. Um, and then at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will be in Pathways to Justice, Inclusive Practices Shaping the Kansas Heartland. So just a quick reminder, you will need to log back in to the Train Learning Network conference page to access the Zoom links for the next sessions or for tomorrow's sessions. The links will be available 30 minutes before each session. So thank you all so much, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow.